Welcome to the first video in the electrochemistry topic. The aim of this video is to try and give you an overview of everything covered in this topic, the big ideas uh, that are going to be contained in it. So this topic is all about redox reactions. Now these reactions are ubiquitous in human life. Uh, the most famous example is probably a combustion reaction, as you can see on the left here. Um, the flames from the combustion of the wood providing heat and also humans have developed the technology to use combustion reactions uh, to generate mechanical work as well such as in the internal combustion engine that powers a car. Um, mostly these are hydrocarbon based fuels but um, the exciting thing about this particular vehicle is it runs on hydrogen which is supposed to be or widely touted as the fuel of the future because when it reacts with oxygen which is a combustion reaction its only product is water which is much less harmful uh, than carbon dioxide gas which is produced by hydrocarbon fuels. So redox reactions uh, in general are those which involve electron transfer. Um, you have something called an oxidizing agent which gains some electrons and we call that process its reduction or the fact that that compound is reduced. Uh, we then say that reducing agents lose electrons and they become we call oxidized. Now one of the most amazing examples to my mind of a redox reaction and the way that the energy from it is used constructively is respiration. Now the reaction here is essentially nothing other than just the combustion of a carbohydrate glucose and conversion into carbon dioxide and water. And as I've just said this releases a huge amount of energy but if this reaction were just combusted, as we saw in the previous video, just simple burning or an internal combustion engine, then as the energy is released, it would literally blow your insides apart. Um, and the amazing thing that we see inside the body is a system for using the energy from this redox reaction in a very subtle and constructive way. Um, and a picture of it is shown here. This is all taking place in part of the cell called the mitochondrion. And essentially what we've got here on the membrane of the mitochondrion is a series of uh, enzymes or huge um, membrane protein complexes which are taking some of the byproducts of uh, glucose respiration um, effectively reacting them with oxygen but in so doing moving H plus ions from the inside of the membrane to the outside. Now the amazing thing about this is that these particles are charged and because there's more of them outside than inside there tends to be what we call a potential difference. So here we've got essentially positive charge on the outside of the membrane and a relatively negative region on the inside. So this is actually a natural system that is using, um, is converting the energy from a chemical reaction into electrical potential energy. Um, and the sort of finale of this amazing um, system is that we have this molecule or, or complex um, machine here called ATP synthase, which is essentially, I've just shown a blown up version here, this is like a, a molecular motor and what's happening here is that the hydrogen ions are passing through the ATP synthase and are being used to drive the turning of this part here, which is essentially a sort of ratcheted motor. And that electrical potential energy from the movement of the protons from the outside to the inside is essentially providing the energy to generate a molecule called ATP. Um, and this molecule here is known as the energy currency of the cell um, and is used to pro provide energy in turn for a huge number of other tasks. And it all comes from this combustion reaction being harnessed in an exquisitely subtle way. Um, by every cell in our body. It's really quite remarkable. So, um, humans in around about 1800, uh, this man called Alessandro Volta, um, managed to replicate on a very crude scale what is happening inside your mitochondria. Um, and he essentially managed to use redox reactions to generate electrical work. And so on the right here you can see um, how he did that. It's, uh, this is known as a voltaic pile. And essentially Volta's pile, or the first battery, um, consisted of strips of zinc and copper alternating with uh, some cardboard uh, acting as a spacer here which is soaked in brine that is essentially acting as an electrolyte which means the ions move through. 
but electrons don't. Now why was this actually a battery? How did he create this electrical potential difference between the terminals? Well, it's all down to the redox reactions that were taking place. So at the surface of these metals, the contact with the water in the electrolyte, we have these redox equilibria that are established between zinc and its oxidized zinc 2 plus form and copper and its oxidized copper 2 plus form. And essentially, if these metals are two different metals, then they'll have different tendencies to lose electrons. You know that zinc is more readily loses electrons. So its equilibrium is going to lie more to the left than the equilibrium for copper. So copper's equilibrium, relatively speaking, is going to be over towards the right. And what that essentially means is that there are more electrons collected on the zinc plates, and so they become negatively charged. So you can see depict the electrons schematically there. There might be more on the zinc than there would be on the copper. You seen too clearly there, but there'll be a potential difference between the two places. And because the electrolyte doesn't allow the electrons to go through, uh, we've essentially created here a potential difference between these two parts of the cell. And that is effectively the basis of all modern battery technology, is this work that Volta did. Um, and now we're seeing um, modern fuel cells using basically the same type of idea, except whereas here we've got the actual chemicals that are going to react as the battery runs down stored within the cell, so it's called a storage cell. Um, in fuel cells, those uh, reactants have to be continuously supplied, but it's ex effectively the same idea. So how are we actually going to be able to build up the type of ideas um, used in this topic where well, the kind of main workhorse of this is known as the standard electropotential or sometimes referred to by the abbreviation of the SEP and given the symbol E standard in this, in this topic. Um, and effectively what we're doing here is we're measuring the position of this equilibrium, so we're measuring the position by the potential difference between a particular, what we call a half cell, so effectively here we've got a piece of zinc and some zinc 2 plus ions in solution, so all the members of the redox equilibrium are being um, are involved here, and we're measuring that relative to this thing called the standard hydrogen half cell. Again, other videos will give you much more detail about what this is, but effectively what we're doing here is we're measuring the potential difference for many, many different half cells. In this case, the standard electro potential is minus 0.76 volts. If I did this with copper and copper 2 plus here, then I'd get plus 0.34 volts and so forth. And so I can build up a huge amount um, of these standard electro potentials just in tables. And remember that the, what that is telling me is effectively the position of this redox equilibrium but in a very precise quantitative way. Oh, that's an extra piece called a salt bridge which you'll learn about in future videos. So use of standard electro potentials, just going to go through two before we finish. I mean the first is predicting cell potential. So imagine that we've made a cell now by connecting up two of these half cells together. Um, we found that the silver half cell here has got a standard electro potential of 0.8 volts, whereas this chromium one is minus 0.74 volts. And so effectively we've got a potential difference between these two, so we can call this the cell potential, or probably more correctly, the cell potential difference, or the cell EMF. And this is just going to be the difference between the positive half cell and the negative half cell. So in other words, in this case, 0 0.80 minus, minus 0.74, which is 1.54 volts. And you can do exactly the same thing with any more complicated cell that you like. Um, the basis is the same. The energy given to every coulomb of charge is just calculated in this way. So you can use these standard electro potentials to predict the potential difference between two different redox equilibria. A second use, and perhaps more widespread, is in predicting the feasibility of redox reactions. I mean, again, it can be linked back to here that the more positive of the two half cells. So we've got this one being negative, 
and this one on the right is the positive half cell, well, is the one where the equilibrium lies further over to the right. So here the equilibrium is lying less far to the right. And so as a result, if we let the electrons move, then the electrons are going to move from the negative to the positive. So in other words, reduction will happen here. So in the right-hand half cell, the more positive reduction occurs and effectively when we let the current flow that means in this case the oxidation will occur in this half cell and so if we just get these two uh, half cells here these two redox equilibria we can look at the standard electrode potentials and we can say that what we would predict to happen is that in this case we would get reduction because it's more positive And in this case, we would predict we'd get oxidation. And so we can essentially say that the feasible reaction, which is the reaction that we just predict on energetic terms is the most likely to happen, can just be obtained by combining the half equation. So this one is going to go in the forward direction. I'll leave out the state symbols just for clarity. Uh, 2i minus, and actually we'll just put this as a single forward arrow, it's going forward. This one's going to go in the reverse direction. So if we combine these, we're going to get a reaction which tells me that mn2 plus and 2i minus are formed. And so effectively what we've been able to do through these standard electrode potentials is predict that this reaction should happen, the feasible reaction. So if we take iodine and manganese, we might have to heat them to get it to go quickly enough. It should form manganese iodide, and in fact that does actually happen. But if we take manganese iodide, we shouldn't be able to see that decomposing and turning back into iodine and manganese at least spontaneously. And so, effectively, this amazing um, simple idea of a standard electrode potential is enabling us to make predictions about which redox reactions will and won't take place. So, to summarize, standard electrode potentials are there to quantify the position of redox equilibria. That's their purpose. It's essentially the tendency of a species to lose or gain electrons. If you've got two redox equilibria with different standard electrode potentials, you can form an electrochemical cell and work out the, the um, potential difference it will produce. And also these standard electrode potentials allow you to predict whether a reaction will take place uh, when two chemicals are mixed, even if they're not separated and forming a cell, as long as they are in some kind of electrical contact, because it tells you the natural direction of electron movement, which is from negative to positive.